Good afternoon, everyone. We got, you're on the second to the last talk of the day, right? So hopefully everyone's enthused, right? Moving along. Everyone's still awake? Uh, so real quick announcement, if you haven't heard, party tonight is at 2100, 9 p.m. Uh, you're I know, from the terrace level, so not the level you're on, but basically one level up, kind of come in around the back. Um, beer and wine will be complimentary. Uh, you'll get two drink tickets when you enter, which so you can get a mixed drink or whatnot. Top shelf, obviously, you'll have to pay for that. Um, but you have a good time. Make sure you be responsible. Get some food before the party as well, something to slop up some of that alcohol. Uh, so, to kick it off, uh, we're going to have Dr. Laura Deason, and she's going to be speaking, uh, basically figuring out, you know, looking at logs and trying to get some value out of them. So hopefully everyone can take some value out of it. Let's give uh, the first time speaker here a round of applause. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to my talk, despite its incredibly boring sounding title. Uh, I did not realize, I've never been to ShmooCon before, I didn't realize when I submitted my talk that everybody else would have like puns and like entertaining things in their talks. So my coworkers can tell you I've tirelessly spent, tirelessly spent the past few days uh, revamping my talk by posting as many cat photos as I can into it. So the title is now not only Time Signature Based Matching for Data Fusion and Automated Automation Detection in Cyber Relevant Logs, it is also how to detect Script Kitty, who you will be meeting shortly. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Lauren. Uh, my background is in math and economics. I'm currently working as a data scientist for Punch Cyber. Uh, I've been working as a data scientist for the past couple years uh, on DARPA's network defense program. Uh, I was told by DARPA that contractors are not to use the official logo, so I made my own. Um, <laughs> All right, what is the Network Defense Program? So really quickly, I think I'm talking too close to this. Uh, the Network Defense Program is a research project that aims to look at, um, as the introduction said, large volumes of data. So you can think network traffic data, other types of log data, and see what we can learn from them by applying some of the latest technology, um, machine learning algorithms, big data, anyone, anyone? Uh, to see uh, if we can detect anomalous or potentially malicious activity uh, without relying on any rule-based signature detection like typical IDSs. The idea being that that can be pretty easy to avoid and we wanted to be able to detect things that wouldn't get caught by such IDS systems. So again, for those of you playing buzzword drinking games, just want to make it clear that we're analyzing big data with machine learning to perform anomaly detection. Okay, let's get to the serious part of the talk. Cats. Uh, this is Script Kitty. He's also my cat, Oliver. Um, hello. Uh, Script Kitty, he wants to hack you, but he's kind of busy. He's got a lot of things going on in his life. He's a very active cat. Um, so what he actually ends up doing is he's going to download a bunch of tools off the internet um, to do his hacking for him automatically while he sits back and watches cat videos. Okay, why did I bring Script Kitty into this? Uh, well, because the analysis that I'm going to be describing to you is looking at um, trying to find traces of automation in these network logs and other log types um, because they do tend to leave a lot of identifiable patterns. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about temporal patterns. Um, so things you can probably already imagine that you would expect to be left behind by automated um, scripts uh, as it was as regarding mal malware would be things like beaconing out to C2 servers, so maybe beaconing out at regular intervals or maybe even highly irregular intervals that appear to be drawn from a pseudo-random number generator. Or any automated script, as long as it's deterministic, you might expect to exhibit similar temporal patterns in terms of when it executes actions. Hey, so I'm going to be focusing on that third bullet point and asking if we have a large set of data um, logging activity in a network or some other kind of um, cyber relevant logs, can we apply algorithms to automatically flag people who have or entities that have similar temporal behavior? Okay? And I'm going to describe to you in a bit more detail why this is harder than it initially sounds at first. Um, but the motivation behind this, a key assumption I'm making is that malicious activity does tend to rely on automated scripts. Okay? I'm fully aware that there is also a ton of legitimate activity that also relies on automated scripts, automatic updating, et cetera. 
Okay, so that is true. The point of the analysis that I'm going to describe to you is not necessarily to immediately zero in on the bad guy on the network. Rather, I like to think of it as a way to generate a new set of features beyond what's just explicitly already in your data set um, that you can then treat as input features to feed into further processing. So other machine learning analytics, outlier detection, um, looking for things that are apparently automated on your network, but that are somehow unexpected or different than other automated activity. Okay, so getting into the details of this particular um, algorithm that I'm gonna describe to you, I just told you that I'm gonna be doing some analysis where I'm trying to filter, rifle through huge sets of time series data and find entities that exhibit similar patterns of activity. So to do that, I first need to explain or define what I mean by similar. Okay, so let's take this really simple example here where you have a couple of IPs and you have timestamps in your log data of when they perform some particular activity. It could be when they talk to a certain server, when they submit a certain DNS query, something of that nature. Okay, so do these two IPs, do I consider them to be exhibiting similar temporal activity in this example? That depends, there's a couple of different ways I could define this. Uh, in one way, which I'm gonna call time signatures, do they have similar time signatures? Um, I might say, no, they're not very similar at all because look, there's only a couple of time bins where they have activity at the same times, right? And the rest of the time, they're each doing their own thing. Or I might notice that if you just look at the pattern of the timing, not necessarily when it starts, if you move over the, uh, the bottom time series there, you can see that they actually match up almost identically. Um, and without hiring you know, Script Kitty here to lasso one of the time series for you, you can see that by just writing down the sequence of inner arrival times that are exhibited by each time series, right? So the gap in time between when activity occurs. Okay, so in this respect, the two time series might be considered very similar to each other. All right, so given that intuitive understanding of the two sort of definitions of similarity that I'm gonna be using, this is after all data science, so we need some hard numbers, so we wanna quantify um, this distance between two time series. Um, so the distance that I'm gonna use, some of you are probably already familiar with, it's called the Jacquard distance. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's actually quite intuitive. Um, Jacquard similarity just measures the similarity of two sets by counting the number of objects they have in common and dividing by the total number of distinct objects they have between them. So the number of objects in common when we consider the time signatures, where we consider these to be the set of time bins where they have activity. For these two IPs, they have two in common, and then they've got 15 total distinct time bins between them, so that's a similarity score of two out of 15, the distance is just one minus that, 0.867. Okay, so we're gonna get a distance metric here that varies between zero and one. Zero means really similar, one means very dissimilar. We can do the same thing with the, um, with the other type of similarity I mentioned, looking at inner arrival sequences. It's slightly more involved here because I don't wanna just consider the set of individual inner arrival times. I actually care what order they happen in. On the flip side, I don't wanna have too strict of a matching criteria and say that the, these two IPs are not similar because they don't have exactly the same sequence because IP1 has that 12 sticking off at the end there, right? So what I'm gonna use is something called shingling. This comes from text matching uh, where you use a similar idea when you're scrolling across text to see if you have two documents that are the same but you don't wanna necessarily enforce perfect matching. Uh, you choose some finite number. In this case, I'm using shingles of length three. And you look at the sliding window of three tuples, um, subsequences contained in this sequence. And you count how many of those they have in common. In this case, five out of the six three tuples that either of them have. And so these two get a similarity score of five, six, or a distance of 0.167. Great, okay. Now that we've established the explicit definition of distances between two sets of times, or between two time series, you can just take your log data, plug it into your Excel spreadsheet, and ask your computer to compute the distance between every pair of IPs in your log, right? Okay, well, obviously, as you may have guessed, it's not that easy, and the problem is scale here. 
So if I make the generous assumption that my computer can compute this Jacquard distance between two time series in, say, one microsecond, that's perfectly fine if I've just got a couple of IPs or a handful of IPs. Um, but each IP you add, oopsies, oh man, <laughs> ruined the surprise. Uh, each IP you add, you can see this problem is going to grow exponentially in size. And as the spoiler bubble there I already told you, and you probably already know, uh, if you have n entities in your data set and you want to find the set of all pair, you want to find the distance for each possible pair, well, the number of computations you're going to have to make scales with n squared, right? And that's the problem. And for that generous assumption I stated earlier of one microsecond, uh, this would imply that if your data set has 100,000 entities, it's going to take this super fast computer over an hour to compute these. A million entities uh, would take over five days. A billion entities would take over 17,000 years. Bitmoji Lauren is not impressed. Okay, so we need something more clever to allow us to, to find these sets of similar items rather than just computing every possible pairwise distance between the entities in our data set. Uh, so what I'm going to describe is a well-known algorithm called locality-sensitive hashing. Okay? Locality-sensitive hashing does the following. Suppose you have millions, even billions of IPs represented on this slide by the eight IPs on the left. Rather than computing each possible pair, um, the distance for each possible pair, I'm going to first take this additional step of applying a, you can think of it for now, as a magical hashing function called minhash, and it hashes each one of these entities into some bucket. Now, the purpose of this hashing function is somewhat different than what you're probably used to a hashing function wanting to do. Normally, you want your hash function to uniquely hash things into their own bucket so you don't have collisions. In this case, we actually want collisions. We want a hash function that has the following magical property. We want it to be the case that when two entities are very close together in the distance space I described earlier, that it's very likely that they'll hash to the same bucket. Conversely, we want it to be the case that for two entities that are very far apart from each other, we want it to be very unlikely that they hash to the same bucket. And the whole point of this is that we don't have time to compute every possible pairwise distance, but if we know that two things are in different buckets and that they're very likely not near each other anyways, and I'm just looking for things that are similar to each other, we don't need to do that computation. Okay, so this minhash function, if you don't care about the underlying math, you can just accept that it's a magical function that has this property. Um, it turns out that it's actually very intuitive and easy to understand how this algorithm works and why it has this property. So just as a real quick for anyone who is interested, um, the way this algorithm works at a high level is suppose you have a few sets with elements. So the sets are labeled S1 through S4. They've got elements A, B, C, D, E. Uh, you can write out which elements are in the set in the form of this characteristic matrix with just a binary indicator of which element is in which set. Uh, what the minhash algorithm does is then it just, um, you can think of it as randomly permuting these rows, and then the minhash that gets assigned, the hash value that gets assigned, is just what is the first element under this new ordering contained in each of the sets. And if you think about it for a little bit, you can convince yourself pretty easily why it's the case that the probability of any two sets getting the same minhash value is exactly equal to their Jacquard similarity because the Jacquard similarity is the number of things they have in common divided by the total number of things they have in their union. Okay? Okay. We're through that part. I know a lot of people in here are more interested in the applications of this to cyber-relevant data. Um, so now I'm going to get to a couple of examples of where I've applied this to actual network data um, as part of my work on the network defense project. So I didn't say earlier, uh, the way we obtain our data for that project is from various partner organizations. Um, so one of these organizations uh, provided us with silk records. So this is NetFlow data. This particular data set is 1.4 billion records covering about 150 days. Okay. And to apply this algorithm, I have to define what I mean by entity. In all those previous examples, I was just calling it IP. Um, I'm actually going to use an even more fine-grained definition of entity here, which is this four-tuple of source IP, destination IP, protocol, and service port. 
um, within a specified time window, which is a day. Okay, so it's actually a five tuple. It's those four things plus the day. So the idea here is that I'm going to find entities, five tuples like that, that are similar to each other in terms of when they have activity on the network. Okay? Um, so the input here is the actual time series, the, the time bins in which they have activity, which I'm calling the time signature, and also that set of inter-arrival shingles so that I can find both things that are similar in terms of doing the stuff at the same time, as well as having connections that follow the same time pattern um, subject to some arbitrary time lag. Okay, so the output of this, um, of this algorithm is going to be for each entity, I can automatically get what is the set of all other entities that are within some distance delta of it, okay? As you might imagine, on a network, particularly a large network, there's a ton of automated stuff going on all the time. There's a lot of reasons you see things happening in coordination. For example, if I, um, I've learned from doing this analysis, in fact, that if I Google image search cute cat gif, um, then when my web page populates with, you know, all the different links I can go to to get cute cat gifs, something called prefetching happens, which actually sends out DNS requests to all those different um, domains at the same time. And when I scroll down the page, it does that again at the same time. So if I were comparing time series of these things, you'll get a lot of matches because of various things like this that cause apparent coordination in your logs. Uh, so what I do with this output, which is... Um, voluminous, there's a lot of it, is that I look at other features, not just the, um, the output of this analytic, but rather features such as the number of distinct destination countries associated with coordinated activity, um, unusual ratios of coordination where you have internal to internal traffic coordinated with internal to external traffic on a network, or simply um, unusual numbers of distinct ports or destination IPs involved in coordination, which can point you towards various types of scanning activity. Okay, so a couple of examples from this particular network that I was looking at. Um, some coordinated activity that was flagged in both cases here. Um, the activity was unusual in the sense that you had internal to internal coordinated with internal to external activity. So in the first graph, what you see is this 10.101 IP um, having communications in the NetFlow logs with another 10.IP at exactly the same times that it communicates with an Egyptian and a Chinese IP. Um, similarly, in example two, you have a 10. Dot communicating with a couple other 10 dots, as well as an, IT, an IP, which is um, blocked out here, uh, which turns out to be a printer, which is accessible over the internet by anyone. So in this case, uh, I think both of these examples, um, they were pinging out to port 161 or 162, so SNMP. Um, so as part of the Network Defense Project, we have cyber subject matter experts, several of whom are sitting in the audience here, um, who look into uh, what's causing these types of behavior. In the latter case, um, our, sub our cyber SME found the web interface for this printer and noted that it is, in fact, accessible by anyone over the Internet. So this is basically a misconfiguration that should probably be brought to the attention of the network administrator. Um, it's also the case, if you look closely, that the toner is very low on that printer, which um, script kitty Trump finds unimpressive. Okay. Uh, another application of this algorithm that I've described is a potential for fusing together disparate data sources. Um, so I have this hypothetical example in my mind. I'm sure there's other similar types of examples. Where suppose you have some sort of NATing device with one IP that's internal facing, one that's external facing, and a whole bunch of internal IPs that communicate with it on one side and a whole bunch of external ones on the other side. And for some reason, you only have visibility into logs on either side of this, but not sort of what's going on in the middle. Now, you can't see explicitly from those logs which internal IP is talking to which external IP, which you might want to know. Let's suppose also that because of jitter, which is very real, the timestamps are not going to align perfectly across the two logs. Moreover, let's suppose that whoever set up sensor number two thought he was in another time zone or something, and they're just not configured at the same time. So there's all these reasons why you can't just uh, easily match on the timestamp to see who's talking to who. Um, so the algorithm I've described before, where you generate this kind of time signature for each one of the internal IPs and each one of the external IPs over um, small blocks of time, 
could theoretically allow you to do some probabilistic matching here. So I've started experimenting with that. I think it could be an interesting application of this. Okay, so I've shown you proof that this method can point us to some likely system misconfigurations. And I just described how, at least hypothetically, it could be used in fuzzy matching algorithms um, to match data sources where you don't have a common join key other than time. But what about using it to protect America? <laughs> this is where I'm hoping to get feedback from several people in this room and at this conference because I think this is a very general algorithm that could be used uh, to match things based on when they have activity. Okay, I'm gonna have to rush through this. I'm being told to stop. Um, one idea as an example that someone has brought up, which I think is really interesting, is using passive DNS records um, to look at when uh, resolution for a particular domain changes to new IPs. The idea being that if you could gather enough passive DNS over a large swath of the internet, Maybe there's some automated, um, automated behavior that's being used by malicious actors you know, to automatically update when their domain changes where it resolves to that you could, such that you could see this time pattern across multiple actors or across multiple implementations of this malware. Um, okay, so for anyone who wants to learn more about this, I'm including several resources here, including a great free online text um, I can't release the code that I've written as part of this project, but it does rely heavily on the open source um, package Spark Neighbors. So all of this was coded in Spark and Scala. Um, Spark Neighbors is a really cool open source implementation of locality sensitive hashing. So if you're interested, I encourage you to go check that out. Okay, and that is all. Thanks. Do we have time for questions or no? I think we might not have time. If anyone has suggestions, I would love to hear them after. And there's a prize cat calendar for anyone who comes up with a really awesome suggestion. And the calendar is pretty amazing, so think hard. <laughs>